All right, everyone. Thanks for uh, tuning in. I'm super, super excited to have not only a client of mine, but a really good friend, David Oliveira. Um, really, we're just going to share just how we got started in real estate. And um, it's going to be a really cool story. And the whole idea of this is to let my followers know that, hey, even where you're at in life, there is still the ability to invest in real estate still in San Diego in California. Um, David, so just a quick thing about David, super humble guy, super just, he's a, has a gregarious personality. He's an entrepreneur, does a lot of different things. His brother is my best friend. He's actually at his house right now, helping him renovate his home that he just bought. Um, he's a UCSD grad. He has three rental properties, and then he has a primary residence that he's actually in the process of building an ADU. He's from Firebaugh, and if anyone doesn't know where that is, it's in Fresno, and that's actually where Josh Allen uh, played high school football. So, David, just really quick, do you mind just sharing about yourself and take take the floor? Of course. Thank you for having me, Mike. Um, like like you mentioned, you know, I'm from a small town, small town boy, uh, farm working community. Went to UCSD uh, pursuing a you know pre med pre med degree, but all that changed. Passion shifted from working in the hospital to helping you know communities in the in within within uh, rural areas. So now you know I got into um, real estate through kind of chance. You know, my dad always told me, you know, as soon as you graduate, buy your house, buy yourself a house. Kind of went in one ear, out the other, went in, up, out the other, and um, kind of hit me when that the, the whole housing crisis hit, right? So uh, it took me some time to really understand, you know, what, how much opportunity a house can bring to me until my dad just told me, you know what, like, you can do it. You know, save some money, sacrifice a little bit right now, save some money and, and make it happen. You'll see what kind of doors will open up moving forward. So honestly, it, it really it comes from my dad, uh, the entrepreneurship as well. Uh, I never realized how much, how savvy he was with money. He's a farm worker, you know, grew up picking crops, not having much money. He was able to purchase a home. He had three rental properties at one point through maybe a, a quarter of what I make now as a teacher. You know, and as a teacher, you, we all know we don't, we don't get paid the big bucks, but we do it because we love it. So we find ways to make it happen. Um, and that's one thing that my parents instilled in me is, you know, if you want something, you got to sacrifice, you know, having fun to really have fun in the future. And that's kind of what I'm striving to do and, and you know, to, to accomplish in the near future for my, my kids. I love what you said and I love what you brought up about your dad, because I think so many of us think that like we should know how to do this stuff on our own. And sometimes we're our environment is going to it really influences like what we're going to do with our lives. And I think it's cool that you brought up your dad because everyone has to start somewhere. And that's the whole idea and bringing you on is like, you're that person for me in my sphere of influences. It's like, Hey, you just, you have to know the right people. You're not going to know everything, but if you can surround yourself with good people, you're going to get there. Um, so cool. Thanks. If, if you don't mind, can we get right into it? Of course. So how old were you? Like, take me back. Like what year did you buy your first home? Kind of take me through like just the emotions. So I was, it was, 2012. So I was what? Wow. You're dating me back, Mike. I was about 20, 22 years old, turning 23. So um, first thing my dad said, hey, you need to jump on this. They have this credit for, for first time home buyers. I missed it because I, one, I was lazy. Two, I didn't save the money that I needed to save. So it was something that uh, I, it was kind of like a learning process in, in, in that in itself. So finally got my first condo. Um, I was paying, was it 1500 for rent, right? So my dad said, why are you paying 1500 for rent? You can own for 1500 or less. So that's what I did. I found a house. I found a condo. I ended up paying 1300 So now I'm owning a home for a lot cheaper. And it just, it just dawned on me. I said, well, if I can continue to do this, you know, now I can mix, I can get some extra cash flow and then maybe do some more in the near future. Um, I didn't really hit my kind of my stride until five years ago. That's when I sold my condo. And then I flipped that into uh, a primary residence and then a duplex right next door. Um, it all kind of happened by chance because I was fixing up my house. I love fixing stuff, even though I didn't know anything about a house, but I would call my dad, hey, what can I do? Or what do you recommend? And little by little, started learning things on my own. Um, took a chance and bought a duplex right next door. And let, let me stop you right there because what you said is super important. And a lot of people think that when you buy an investment property, you have to put 20 or 25% down. And I love what you said you bought a starter home with the idea that you were going to rent it out down the road. And I think a lot of people buy a home 
for equity purposes, which is great, but they just go around and sell that and use it to buy their next home. But that's not how you win monopoly, right? You win monopoly by collecting cash, right? Having assets. So um, thanks for bringing that up because you bought that home with a low down payment with the idea that you were going to live there for an extended period of time, but that you were going to rent it out down the road. And saving 20% nowadays is nearly impossible, especially in the market that we're in. Um, so thank you for bringing that up. Um, I love the Simon Sinek, like know your why. And I know you're a smart guy, but like, what was the why for you? Like, I know that we listen to our dads and gain knowledge from people that are smarter than us, but what was like the deep rooted thing for you? The why, like I said, it has to stem back to my parents. My parents, you know, my dad came here when he was 16 years old with no money, just one pair of shoes and figure it out. You know, you're the oldest, you got to figure it out and, and find a way to, to help the family back in Mexico. So that for me was my, my driving force. I said, if you can do it making four or five bucks an hour, purchase a home, why can I do it when I first graduated at making 17 yeah. an hour, right? So that's always been my drive. Like, what can I do? What can I take from my parents to really, you know, expand for, for my, my future generations? And that's been my, my biggest why. Um, that and then I never realized how, how much, um, how, how savvy they were with their money. And with and they were entrepreneurs themselves, but I never realized it. They used to um, sell toys, you know. From toys, they went to selling clothes, and then from clothes, they kind of expanded into selling gold. And that's where it really hit for them. The gold mm. was it took off. It helped them out, and they they were able to purchase a home with a farm worker a farm worker uh, salary. So that's kind of what I that, that I instilled with myself. Is, yeah, I don't make much money as a teacher, but how can I hustle like my parents? to be able to do what I want to do. I love to travel, as you can see. You, you know that I love to go everywhere. Um, yep. But I also like to, to make sure that I'm setting myself, my, my, my daughter, uh, in the future, right? So that's one thing where, that's why I dabbled into dance floors. I knew nothing about dance floors, but I took a chance. I said, you know what? This is an opportunity to, it's a niche, an opportunity to make some good money. Well, let's, let's, let's figure it out. I opened up a, uh, a dress store. At one point, I knew nothing about dresses. But I'm over here fitting women for for our wedding dresses, and I have no can we clue can we can can we talk about that because you are like a it's it's an amazing entrepreneur. Um, David first of all knows like everyone in San Diego County. Um, his wife is a florist. He runs a dance floor. Like, what made you jump into the things that you may not have known about? And like, what was that emotion behind? Like, this is a risk, but I, I guess what was like the driving force behind all that? I think um, just not being afraid. Uh, that's a, a big thing for that I learned while working at the nonprofit. I worked there for 10 years. I was a, a director for school programs. And my, my, one of my mentors there always said, I love how you always see opportunity in, in mm. areas of need. So we have a need here. You find, you find a solution and you make it work. So that's one thing where I, I saw that there was a lot of parties. People were requesting dance floors. And it just happened that one of my tenants had a successful dance floor business in TJ, but wanted to expand in the States. And I said, well, let's partner, you know, let's partner up, let's make this happen. And now, you know, we thankfully it, it blew up and it, it's doing pretty well. Um, same thing during the pandemic. My wife said, you know what, when I retire, I want to be a florist. I, I love flowers. I love doing this, I love doing that. We had so much time during the pandemic. I said, hey, why don't we just start it and see how it goes? Maybe it can be something where you set it up now and in the future, you're just having a good time, you know, making floral arrangements. So it's just finding those opportunities not being afraid because it is scary. Buying a house is scary. Don't get, don't get me wrong. It's scary. Even after, you know, four or five, six properties, you still think about it like, well, what am I doing the right choice? You know, am I making the plunge? Is, it, is this really going to work out? But if we don't take no chances, we're never going to know if, if we can actually make something me, This is a family friendly podcast, but Luis and I had the saying in college and it was zero F's given, right? <laughs> And when I can tell that you've had such an influence in his life on that, because it's true, you don't want to live a life that you're going to have regrets on. And you, you're a testament of that. And it's super cool just to experience just what you're seeing, obviously, on the real estate side, but just your personal growth also. Um, going back to the real estate, the next question we had was uh, coming up with the down payment, right? So when you bought your first home, how much did you put down? What was the like mental stress going through your head? Kind of talk about that. Well, like I said, I, I kind of, it took me some time to really understand how important it was to save. Not until 
I, I have to amount to my wife. She's the one that was, she's like my financial advisor. She would say, just because you have all money coming in doesn't mean you have to spend it right away, right? So she would give me a limit. So it came down to really creating those, those kind of goals, you know, do can your, you put your, that, can you put that in like super basic terms? So let's say that you had your, um, you, you got paid from your school. Were you saving like 15% and then just keeping that in a savings account and then using that and having that grow or where, where, where was that going? So I, I didn't know much about, you know, saving accounts where it can grow on interest or whatnot. It was just more like save as much as I can and gotcha. then try to make it happen. So now I'm dabbling more into, you know, savings accounts, uh, ways where I can invest my money and have my money work for me. But in the past, it was more like, don't buy Starbucks, save that money, put it away, pretend like you bought Starbucks, make coffee at home and then mm. go from there. So it really came down to not buying shoes, you know, minimizing my debt to income uh, because you know, as a teacher, I don't make much money, so I can't have as much debt, especially as I continue to grow with, with, my, uh, with my properties. I have to make sure I have to be very strategic about what I buy and I don't buy. So, uh, but before my first purchase, it really came down to just save as much money as I can um, and then, you know, try to make that happen and, and hopefully, you know, grow from there. But my parents cool. were, were definitely a great influence in that. Um, they always said, you know, you have to sacrifice. If you're going to keep on buying Jordans, you're not going to reach your goal. So, person that went were Jordans. Can we buy no more Jordans anymore? And I can't remember the last time I bought some Jordans. So yeah. Uh, what was the what was the purchase price if you remember on the first home that you bought and how much was the down payment? Purchase price was two oh five. Uh down payment was about thirteen thousand dollars. So uh, so so to everyone that's watching this, keep that in mind because yes, you're not gonna find a home nowadays that's two oh five, right? But people are probably gonna have a little bit more saved, but it's all relative. And obviously 3% of that amount to you was a lot of money, right? Yeah. So what was that thought process like? I mean, did you kind of like, you do your research, but is it kind of like, Hey, I just kind of go for it. Like take me through that. I, it was more, I just went for it. I didn't know anything about real estate. I didn't uh, know, you know, what came with that, you know, buying appliances, doing all these other things that I just thought, okay, I have my house and I'm ready to rock and roll. No, there's a lot of things that we have to think about nowadays, right? So, um, but the, the biggest thing was just losing that fear, making that plunge, and then going for it. Because, yeah, 13000 for someone making $17 an hour is quite a bit. You know, yeah. I, I was taking home maybe $3,000 a month after taxes. So, that's already over six months. So, well, like five months of, uh, almost five, a little bit over five months of, yeah. um, you know, my, my salary. So, it was, uh, it was scary. It was scary. Yeah. And like I said, it, it continues to be scary, but you know, just finding ways to, to get creative. Yeah. And we'll, and we'll, and we'll finish on that too. Um, the next question we had come in is what's the biggest lesson you've learned through investing in real estate. So you got a lot of properties now you're doing pretty well at monopoly in real life. Uh, take me through just what's, what's a lesson you've learned through it. The biggest lesson I think, and I, and I have to attribute this to my wife is, Let's have as much, uh, less debt as possible. So the biggest things that we, um, we started encountering as teachers is, you know, we won't qualify for much of a house if we have a lot of debt. So we started getting rid of the, the car payments that we had. We took those back, sold the cars. Uh, we bought cars that we can afford cash. So that way we have more house that we can purchase. Let's talk about that because you have good debt and you have bad debt, right? Sure. So good debt is things that are lended that have assets, right? Um, and then bad debt are things that depreciate in value, right? So obviously, you know, your car loans, your credit cards, those are things that are not going to grow you financially over time. So yeah, thanks for bringing that up too. Yeah. So that it just really came down to that. And like I said, she's, uh, I, I had one house in 2016. You fast forward now I have by hopefully by the end of 2022, I'll have nine different doors producing income. Yeah, I apologize. I apologize because I'm only talking about the properties that you own in San Diego, and I know that you do stuff out of state. Um, that'll be for another podcast. But um, yeah, no, you're. I, I totally forgot about that too. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, okay, uh, we're almost finishing up. Thanks, guys. What would you recommend, like a beginner investor, do? Like someone that's super fresh. Um, like, wh wh how would you get started? It, you know, take me through the beginning. I think that the biggest thing right now, given the you know the market's just booming, um, we have to make sacrifices. You know, we have to make sacrifices. Trust me, I used to love going out. I would 
any money came, coming in, I would go Vegas, go downtown, go eat, do all these things. But all that cuts down. If you do the math, you, you're spending thousand, maybe more a month that can easily be going to a, to a down payment without even having to save a penny. So th that was the biggest thing for me. Is, and my dad always said, you have to make sacrifices. You have to figure out yep. what you truly want and then make it happen. So making those sacrifices, try to keep as le less debt as possible, because that's the biggest reason why a lot of people are, are not qualifying for, for that. And then as you make those sacrifices, you'll see the, the savings account grow. Um, and through that process, you'll be able to reach that goal that you want. Thank you. This is a really cool one. Um, so you got your primary residence right now. And what Kiyosaki, Rich Dad, Poor Dad would say is when you buy a primary residence, you're not really getting a return. Yes, that home's going to appreciate, but really where cash flow comes from is investments. So you being creative, kind of tell us about what you're doing on your primary residence and how you got started with that. So this all stemmed from, and I was working with Mike calling him, hey, Mike, can I qualify for this house? Uh, yes, you can. Maybe you can't. You might have to sell something. And for me right now, my biggest thing is hold as much as I can. And then in the future, maybe sell for a five unit, 10 unit property. So I was kind of stuck. Um, but like I said, you're only as good as your team. So Mike presented the idea. Well, what do you, have you ever explored this particular uh, renovation loan? And honestly, they never dawned on me. But then once that got going, you know, all the ideas started kind of rolling out. We yeah. decided we want to build because we were looking for houses with pools with plenty of land and so forth. And we just couldn't find anything in our budget. So we said, why not build one? Why not work with what we got, build our, our future Airbnb paradise because Airbnb has been amazing to me. Um, and then build a pool, do your nice little uh, barbecue area, but build a, a little one bedroom house right on top. And that's when I just got really excited. So that way, you know, we're doing that right now. In my primary residence, we remodeled it completely. Uh, with the help of Mike, we were able to remove mortgage insurance in a matter of six months, which is unheard of without having to do any sort of uh, appraisal. And, and how much did you put down on your initial investment on that home? Uh, we put down 10%. It was 5%. Oh, yeah. Wait, wait, you're right. 5% <laughs> down. You put 5% down on that home. You did some remodeling, some TLC, put some sweat equity in. You got rid of mortgage insurance a year later, less than a year later, and then you're using that equity because equity just sits there, right? If you don't do anything with it, it just it's there. But you're utilizing that equity to go and buy, to go and finance an ADU, a bitch in backyard that you're going to cash flow on. And I mean, I mean, like you know, I get credit for this because I do the loan, but I, I think these type of loan options are just amazing, and it transforms everything. And it gives you the opportunity to even save money on that ADU so you and your family can go buy a bigger house and then rent out the main in the front. So the, the creativity goes on and on. And that that's to your testament, you know, David, that you have this creativity to think of these things. I mean, I, you know, you know so many professionals and I think it's all your professionals try to keep up with you. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's like you're giving me ideas too. So it goes both ways. Um, so for anyone that wants to know more about that product, it's really cool. Um, but I want to finish this up because David's got to help his brother <laughs> with some sweat equity, but <laughs> is there anything, David, that you would go back and tell your younger self when you were 22 years old, maybe dispelling any fears? Like, what would you go back and tell that 22 year old David? 22 year old David, I would say, you know what, forget about all the, you know, going out, forget about spending all this, you know, unnecessary money and put that towards something that can work for you in the near future. Um, I think I blew easily $20,000 worth of free money from financial aid that I could have put that to buy me a house early on. And a lot of students that, that are probably 18, 19, 20 are getting that type of money. Now save it, reinvest it, buy yourself a home. Because really five thought of years, like one of my homes went from 350000 to half a million. So it's one of those things where a house is not going to, you know, it, it may go down a little bit, but in the future, you're, if you want to become a millionaire, buy a house, sit on it, and you're going to be okay. So save as much money as you can. Get rid of any debt you got. Fresh out of college or even family, if you want to buy a new car, hold off on that car for now. Let's let's buy that house uh, because all that is working against you. And in the future, take out a, a refinance, take that money out and buy yourself your car cash. So there's, there's ways to make it happen. Um, but like I said, get rid of all the debt you can. Um, and, you know, it's scary. 
trust me, surround yourself with people that, that care, that are like-minded. If you have a girlfriend, wife, husband, whatever it is, get on the same page, create a vision board. Um, my wife and I, every year we set our goals on our whiteboard and then we cross them off. Did we reach them? Yes. All right. I've Great. seen it. It's pretty That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's stuff like that. Accountability at the end of the day. If you don't have something that you see every single day and you hold yourself accountable, you're never going to reach it. So I'm not, I don't make much money, but I have goals that I can, you know, smart goals that I can reach. Um, and then hopefully that'll in turn will turn into larger goals in the near future. So I want to own, um, you know, several apartment complexes, but in order to do so, I have to have a supportive wife who she's there 24 seven. She's my interior designer, my, my coach, my financial advisor, everything. So if you have someone like that that supports you, hold on to that and run with it because the sky's the limit, you know, no matter how much money you make or you don't make, you're only as good as your partner. So, um, I gotta, I gotta give kudos to where kudos is earned. So, um, that's definitely where, where it goes. That's awesome. Hey, thanks a lot for your time, David. This has been super, super incredible. And it's really cool, honestly, just to see what you're doing. Um, I'm fired up just talking to you. It's always nice just to be around people that give you that good, positive energy. There's so much negativity going on and saying, don't do this, don't do that. And you want to take calculated risks, right? We're not saying go and frivolously go spend all your money on a home, right? There is definitely a process to doing that. And you've been successful at that. And uh, again, thanks for being a good friend. Thanks for being a, a client. And thanks for your time too. This has been awesome. No Thank you for having me, Mike. It's, it's been awesome. Any way I can help if anybody has questions. Um, cool. I'm not an expert, but I'll, I can speak on my experiences and, and hopefully help someone. Awesome. Thanks for the time, man. Awesome. Have Thanks, a good Mike. one. You too.